text today is an amazing one. It is yet another example, and I want you to hear this, of the role that faith in the Lord and how we respond to the Lord play in our relationship with the Lord. text shows the role that faith plays. It shows the role that our response plays in our relationship with Christ. I wanted the college students today of something that the Lord placed on my heart Saturday night before last when I was preparing, not this, not yesterday, but Saturday night before last when I, um, learned that I had the privilege of speaking to them. I warned them of the orchestrated, concerted, well-funded, worldwide effort to separate them from their reverence for Christ. The Bible teaches that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We're living in a world where there's a great push towards secularism. America is becoming uh, increasingly secular. There is a... There is a... Uh, a desire, there is, there are those who want to silence the voice of the preacher, challenge our religious liberties, confine us to the four walls of the church, and then shut the church down. All in an effort to separate people from the fear of God. It is not, the, the devil is not concerned about your graduating from college um, on top. Amen. You can be the valedictorian, the salutatorian. You can graduate summa cum laude, cum laude, O oh Lord. Satan doesn't care. He just wants to separate you from the Lord. Lose your fear. Lose your respect for the things of God. Um, cause you not to value church and service and worship. I keep telling you, that is what this, this secular push in church is all about. The more secular the churches come become, the more laid back the churches become, the less reverential they are. When people get ready to go somewhere that matters to them or to do something that matters, people don't look like they're going to the toilet. People don't dress like they're on their way to Walgreens. They fix up because they're on their way somewhere. It is the will of Satan to convince you that church is nowhere. You come any kind of way and you adopt a laid back posture. Uh, you lose your hunger for God. Sometimes you have to work now to just get people to lift their hands because you're not hungry for them. Amen. I remember being in church 
when we didn't have praise teams. We didn't need a team to get you to praise the Lord. Just pick any two folk, whether they could sing or not. Just anybody. So I want you two to lead devotional service. They get up there, and for the next 30 or 40 minutes, folk testifying, getting up, telling of his goodness, saying a, saying a, a call and response song. For about 15 minutes, they testify. And then sometimes you didn't get a chance to sing your song for people because it was in them to tell it. But the spirit of Laodicea, the last epic of the church age, where the saints are filled with apathy, we say that we have need of nothing. See, the comment, have need of nothing, is not a status, a comment on the financial condition of the person. For there are people who are poor and need everything, but they are apathetic. They will still put forth no effort to improve their position. See, the spirit of apathy is one where you put forth no effort. It's one of the reasons why I, one of the many reasons I detest all things hip hop. It taught our young men and young women to develop a I don't care attitude. In many cases, they don't even sit up straight in a chair, laid back like you just don't care. Apathetic. Apathy. Then you throw, you throw in there these clowns who are trying to legalize marijuana. Yeah, that's what we need. Something else to rob you of your get up and go. That's exactly what we need to peddle to the people. You already have lost your drive at 25. Something's going on. It has been medically proven that the young men of this generation don't have the testosterone that their father's generation had. The fathers don't have what their grandfathers had. There's something going on. The devil is making us weak. You're not with me. I said to the college students, let me get to this. Uh, don't let them separate you from your love for the Lord. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the, neither the things that are of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Love of world precludes love of the Father. They cannot coexist. If you love God, the devil will try to, through offering you worldly things, Sometimes you find yourself in a classroom with a professor who spews out things against the Bible, spews out things against Christianity, and that person is, control, is in control of your grade, and you find yourself sitting there, and you're the only one in your class who believe like you believe. I want to tell you, believe it anyway. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't let the world cause you to chase it at the expense of your relationship with Christ. So our text deals with our relationship and the role that faith in Christ plays. The last time, uh, this past Thursday night, during Thursday night's Bible study, we saw our Lord correct a distraught, desperate father who said something to the Lord that on the face of it, it seemed good, but Jesus was insulted by it. The man said to Jesus, if thou canst do anything for my son, if you can do anything, please help us. Jesus gently correct him and said, the problem is not uh, whether I can do anything. The problem is whether or not you can believe. Jesus says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. You can read about it in Mark chapter 9. Man had a demon in him. And Jesus' disciples couldn't cast the devil out of him. 
The man brought, brought him to the disciples. They couldn't cast the devil out. So the man said to Jesus, because that demon just acted up in front of Jesus. If you can do anything, please help us. What if I can do? He put the if in the wrong place. The leper didn't say to the Lord in Matthew's gospel, the leper didn't say, if uh, you can, you can, he, you can make me clean. The leper said, if thou will. See, it, whether or not it's your will, not whether or not you have the power. See, because our God has the power. Amen. You know, we even see this relationship uh, with the angel Gabriel. Follow me. In Luke's gospel, chapter 1, when the angel Gabriel spoke to Zechariah, Zechariah, the husband of Elizabeth, who would be the parents of John the Baptist. Let me lay this foundation. Zechariah was doing the highest order of of, of a priest, he was uh, keeping the, the, the inner court, the innermost court of the temple. His job was serving, he was keeping the candles lit. And with the sheer number of priests, uh, you didn't get this opportunity, that opportunity many times. Perhaps in a whole lifetime, you might get a chance, get your shot once. Zachariah was in there, and while in there, the mighty Gabriel, came and told him, said, Zachariah, something wonderful is going to happen. Your wife, you and your wife are going to bring forth a child, and he's going to be somebody special, said, and he shall be great, and you're going to call his name John. He's going to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ, and just talked about uh, how great John will be, and Zachariah unwittingly uh, insulted Gabriel. The Bible says, and Zechariah said unto him, said unto the angel, whereby, verse 18, shall I know this? How am I going to know that what you just said is true? For I am an old man, and my wife is well stricken in years. How, how, how can this be? How will I know? And Gabriel was insulted and said in verse 19, and the angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel that standeth in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And you're going to ask me for a sign. The sign is, I'm Gabriel. He says, so if, since you just want one and you won't take the word uh, at, at my mouth, you won't speak another word. Till the child is born. How about that? And Zechariah came out and he couldn't talk. Let me tell you something. When the word is preached, don't you fight. When the word is preached, you ought to say amen. 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 Don't sit there and whisper under your breath. You need to say amen because God is sending you deliverance. Yes. Gabriel said, I beg your pardon. I'm Gabriel. And read it when you get home. Another I beg your pardon, uh, incidents took place in Genesis chapter 17. And, and we also see it in Genesis chapter 18. When the angels, I won't read it, but they promised uh, that Sarah was going to have a child. And Sarah laughed. And the angels want to know, what's funny? What's funny? So when God, let me tell you, there's nothing too hard for God. So we, we used to believe that in holiness. The angel said, wait a minute. Well, why is she laughing? And, and Sarah, uh, she got scared and lied and said, well, well, I didn't laugh. Abraham said, you did laugh. But she wasn't the only one that laughed. In chapter 17, he laughed. And they wanted to know with him. Because he, he said, well, I'm old. And my wife has passed the flower of her age. And we're going to have a son. And they laughed at God's promise. And those angels said, I beg your pardon. I'm, I'm not trying to be funny. And by the way, at the time when the word came, uh, for the last time before the son was born, Abraham was 99. And Sarah was 98. And then when, when Isaac uh, was born, Abraham was 100. 
And Sarah was 90, but there's nothing too hard for God. Matter of fact, when God gave Abraham the promise, Abraham said to the Lord, God, won't you just accept Ishmael? Can't you just take him? I, mean, I got him from, from Haggai. Won't you just, he's here. God said, no, he's, he's the son of the bond woman. So that's not what I said that I was going to do. See, to get God's blessings, you don't have to take shortcuts. Just wait on him. And he will do it. Speaking of age, in our text, our Lord's encounter with the man, we find this man who had been in the condition that he was in, for almost four decades. Four decades, almost two years shy of four, in a state of paralysis. Muscles by now totally wasted away. By now, terrible bed sores. Four decades. Um, that's a generation. That's a lifetime for many people. According to Statistica, 273.6 men per 100,000 and 163.9 women per 100,000 died in 2017 between the ages of 40 and 44. So 38 years is a lifetime. This man had been in this condition that long. The question of our text is, had the long years of discouragement dampened or robbed him of his independent determination to be delivered. That's the point. Are you following me? Let's look at the contextual setting. According to verse 1, we find that we're in a, a feast of the Jews. One would be safe to assume that it was Passover, but I think uh, because it was the most, it was the largest of the three annual feasts that uh, caused the Jewish males to come to town. That was the Passover, that was Pentecost, and that was the one that I think personally that this one was, the Feast of Tabernacles which is also called the Feast of Gatherings. I don't think it was uh, Pentecost because in chapter 2 and verse uh, 13, I don't think it was Passover, excuse me, because in chapter 2, verse 13, we see him talking about the Passover. It says, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Well, in chapter 5, Jesus is in Jerusalem again at yet another feast of the Jews. Probably the Feast of Gatherings or the Feast of Tabernacles, the third of the three great festivals, was the Autumn Festival, and it was to celebrate the harvest, the fruit of the ground, that God let the corn grow. That God let the grapes grow so they had wine. That God gave them oil that God provided. Do you ever thank him as you walk into the grocery stores? Do you ever thank him as you exit? It? Do you ever thank him when you consider the provisions that God have made? Amen. So they were at this feast. Are you with me? And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, none of the other Gospels records this event, mostly because the main reason is 
that the other gospels dealt mainly with the miracles that Christ performed in Galilee. John deals with some Galilean ministry, uh, miracles, but John includes the Jerusalem miracles as well. See, there, Jesus' earthly sojourn was divided in his Galilean ministry and his Jerusalem ministry. So we see here in our text, as a matter of fact, our text places, uh, this text is after the Lord performed a mighty miracle, listen to this, in Capernaum while he himself was in Canaan of Galilee. <laughs> now, how did he do that? He sent his word. The Bible says in chapter 4, verse 43, Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. And then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans, look at this, they received him, having seen all the things that he did uh, in Jerusalem at the feast. For they also went up to the feast. So they saw the miracles uh, that Jesus had performed. So the people in Galilee, they received him. Uh, so Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he made water into wine. Remember that? In chapter 2, it was his first miracle. And that was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. Come heal my son, Jesus. Please, my boy is about to die. Then said Jesus unto him, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. When Jesus spoke to this man, he was laying the foundation for something. The noble man said unto him, Sir, here it is again, Sir, come air, come down air, come before my child die. Now, the nobleman made the same error that we make. See, we ask the Lord to heal, and then we try to tell him how to do it. Now, Lord, I need you to fix this, and here's how I want you to do it. No, 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 you don't tell God how. You just tell him, you just, you just tell him what you want. You can't tell him how to do it. Jesus, he said, now you need to come before my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy son liveth. Know what Jesus did. He shifted it. See, because we like to be in control. And remember, this was a nobleman. So he's, a, he's accustomed to telling people what to do. Jesus said, I ain't, I'm not going anywhere. You go. I'm going to do it. But you go. And your son will live. Now, thank God that the nobleman had some sense. The Bible says, and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. I'm glad that man didn't stand there and argue. No, now, come on now. You got to come. You got to, you got to come to my house. Come on now. Oh, well, why, you won't, why you won't come on? Is it, is it because I'm from Capernaum? Why are you, why you doing me like that? No, Jesus said, you go home. Your son will live. And you know what that man did? He grabbed hold of faith. He let Jesus dictate the terms. And he went his way. And as he was on, was now going down, his servants met him and told him 
saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to mend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So then the father knew that it was at the same hour, the good God Almighty, in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And himself believed. Then that man became a believer. And his whole house. It was on the heels of this miracle that our Lord goes back to Jerusalem. Are you following me? So now he goes there and I need you to just bear with me. Are you with me? It says, now that was at Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. Now, this pool, you need to see this in your mind's eye. Um, it was trapezoidal in form. This is the way it was shaped. And a trapezoid, of course, is a, a four-sided uh, figure that where two of the sides are equal and two are unequal in length. And with the trapezoid, thank you, there were five porches. They looked like entrances. They looked like Roman columns, yes. like that. So you go in that way, and then there's the pool on the inside. Now, the size of this pool, lest you think the why, it was 165 to 220 feet wide by 315 feet long and divided by a central partition with five protocols. It was a large place. And the truth is, it was a beautiful, Sister Diamond, it was a beautiful structure. Something to behold. And in this beautiful place with five entrances, and all five of them were fixed up real nice. Oh my. Notice how contrasting you're going to see how contrasting the scene was. You're going to see how sin had wrought havoc on the world. For there in this beautiful place was a vast throng of afflicted, sick, and helpless people waiting for the stirring of the water. The scene was contradictory. Are you with me? The scene was quite contrasting. The beautiful pool with five entrances populated by suffering humanity. Quite possibly similar to the streets of L.A. Or any of our major, uh, San Francisco. Our major, many of our major big cities now are so filthy and uh, uh, piles of uh, human excrement and urine and uh, uh, all kinds of diseases are breaking out on the streets of some of our major U.S. cities. And here's this beautiful place with this huge pool and the, all of these sick people and and. And, and district missionary, what was the atmosphere like? It was one that nobody in here would want to be in because there was no harmony. There was no camaraderie. There, were, there was no uh, working together. Mm -mm, couldn't afford it. Because the cure suggested that the atmosphere be every man for himself 
and God for us all. What do you mean? At a certain season. You can't find certain seasons on the calendar. You can't find certain seasons on your watch. You can't find it. At a certain season. There's no pattern to certain seasons. At a certain season, an angel would come down and trouble the water. And here's the thing about the cure. The cure was so limited. Only one person could get healed at a time. So there is no hint as to when he's coming. There's no pattern as to when the water would be stirred. And everybody knew uh, once the water was stirred, only one person could get healed. So nobody was there to help someone else get into that water. Now I would allow for perhaps there were some sick folk there who had uh, well family members. Well, they're sitting around watching the water. But you know what? There's another sick man with family members. They're watching the water. And Lord have mercy on the sick folk who had no family. They were watching the water, but they knew they didn't have a chance. The bathroom situations were not like what we're accustomed to today. The disinfectants, the medicines to address Bad sores and, oh my, none of the modern things that we're accustomed to today and caring for those who need care were in place at that time. Can you imagine the stench from the place? The dysentery that was there and uh, the utter hopelessness that was there. Can I get a witness? And normally, still waters are beautiful, calm, the beautiful color of the water. But not if you're sick and you believe that your only hope is for the water to be stirred and you can't stir the water. Nothing you could do to stir the water. And all you could do is wait. Sun up. Sundown, waiting. Praise the Lord, clear days, rainy days, waiting. And if the rain or a storm troubled the water, but it wasn't the angel who troubled the water. And you got in the water because the storm troubled the water, but it wasn't the angel that troubled the water. You came out just as sick as you were and when you went in. It was a terrible place. Jesus goes there. Can I get a witness? And you know what he does? He goes, as he walks in, uh, he walks past many of them. We're not told the number of folk. We're just told that there was a great multitude. So it was more than five or six. Could have been hundreds. Mm -hmm. And he walks past them and he goes to this man. One writer said that he went to the worst case. Notice how the writer, for those of you who love the Bible, the scene shifts from a large crowd to just one man. Goes from showing us all of these sick people and it boils down to one single solitary human being in the midst of a vast throng. God looked at one man. I'm glad that day at the Temple Church of God in Christ, for all them folk that was in there, the Lord saw me and the Lord saved me. To my knowledge, Mother, turned out the only one that got saved that day, but he saw me. 
Aren't you glad that he saw you? When he saw you, he looked at the world, but he saw you. Pointed you out. Brought you out. And you're sitting here now sanctified. Go from the crowd to just one man. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He did do it. And now, the thing about this man that I want you to know is that this man had been in that condition even before the Savior was born. He'd been in the condition 38 years. Jesus started his earthly ministry at the age of 30. He preached for three years. And then they crucified him. Third day he rose from the dead. So, so this man was uh, like this when the angel said, Go and tell it on the mountain. Yes, when they brought the good news to the shepherds that on this night, the Savior, Christ the Lord, is born. And suddenly there was in the heavens a multitude of angels singing. Praise the Lord. Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth peace, goodwill toward me. This man was in that shape when that happened. When, 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 when Jesus was baptized of John in the river Jordan. Yes. And the father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased. This man was in that condition. When Jesus went into the temple and opened the scroll and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For it hath he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the sick. This man was in that condition. And uh, on this day, Jesus walks in and he focuses on one man. Matthew Henry said this. He said, one who had been an invalid for 38 years his disease was grievous. He had a disease. He had uh, lost the use of his limbs. It is sad uh, to have the body so disabled that instead of it being the soul's instrument, it has become even in, in the affairs of his life, it's burden. Yes, this man, see the text doesn't say that he was born this way. The text just says he was that way for 38 years. So we don't know how old he was. What is implied is that this was not a congenial condition. He was not born with it. He got sick. And over time, the fingers didn't work. Over time, the legs wouldn't work. Over time, his body became a prison to him. Yes, yes, yes. And after it happened to him, praise the Lord, now he's in a body that is a burden. He was now lame longer, one writer said, than most lived. Question is, shall we complain of one wearisome night or one fit of illness who perhaps for many years have scarcely known what it is to have been sick a day? It is amazing how we complain when we barely, barely have ever been sick. When many others, better than we, have scarcely known what it has been to have a well day. Some of us complain when we're sick one day. And then there are other people who don't know what it's like to have a well day. But they carry on in Jesus' name. This man was in a bad place. 
He had been there for 38 years. Are you with me? And the method, uh, the cure was one, it was medicine that he couldn't take. He couldn't take the medicine. It's bad when you can't take the medicine. Even if the medicine worked, if you can't take it, if you can't afford it, if you can't get it, it can't help you. What you mean, can't take the medicine? The man said, every time I tried to get in, somebody got in ahead of me. He couldn't take the medicine. The medicine came when the water was troubled. But the medicine came with restrictions. Only heal one at a time. Can I get a witness? So now, Jesus walks in. And Jesus saw him lie. Jesus looked at the man laying there in that condition. And then John says something powerful, but he said it in a way that if you're not a serious Bible student, you won't get it. He says, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. That is, Jesus had supernatural knowledge of the man's sickness. Knew how long the man had been sick. I want you to know today, the Lord knows how long you've been dealing with whatever it is. Oh, I know what you're saying. It seems like it's taking so long. God knows how long it has been. And the Lord won't let it last too long. See, if it's still going on, that's a sign that it's not too long. So that means you can, you can handle it because there have no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able but will with the temptation provide a way for you to escape it. You ought to throw your hands up and say I can take it. Because when, it's, when it has been too long my God, the Lord will come in and make it right. Yes, sir. He knew how long that man had been there. And so Jesus asked the big question. We're getting ready to go home. We got to go to salt of the earth. Jesus asked a question that uh, if you're not spiritual, you would look at him and go, duh. But it was a very intelligent question. Praise the Lord. Many of doctors have asked their patients this question. Many people who work with people in rehab have asked uh, those who are in recovery the same question. Because sometimes a person can be in a thing for so long that they become their own worst enemy. Why are you still drinking? Why are you still smoking? Why are you still dilly-dallying? Why are you still fooling around? Don't you want to live? Don't you want to be made whole? Why are you in class and you won't pay attention? Don't you want to be somebody? It was a reasonable question. You want to be respected? Why are you still playing? You want to you wanna live? Then why play Russian roulette with your life? Don't you want to be made whole? Jesus looked at that man and wanted to know if that man had succumbed to his illness. It was a question of the man's will not of Christ's ability, but of that man's ability. Many mothers, many fathers have struggled with their children with this same question. You scratch your head when you see the behavior of a son or a daughter who is doing something that they know is against their best interest. And you, you look at them and you ask them, don't you want to be somebody? 
bring me up on my monitor here. You ought to look at your neighbor and ask them, don't you want to be made whole? Mm -hmm. Jesus wanted to know, oh Lord, have bedding down. Some people are bedded down with their alcoholism or their heart trouble or partial paralysis or whatever. They become psychological and spiritual invalids, treating, uh, retreating within themselves. Some have allowed their trial to get the best of their minds. Jesus wanted to know, hallelujah, what do I have to work with? Avoiding responsibilities, becoming more and more self-centered as they demand sympathy from others. Often while dealing with these kinds of folk, whether in the hospital or the doctor's office, whether at a rehab clinic, you can't help but ask them, do you want to live? Do you want to get well? There have been people in the hospital dying from lung cancer. And all they want is another smoke. Another drag off the cigarette. Here you are with cirrhosis of the liver. And you still want another drink. Well, Lord, you're sick. But you won't take the medicine. Mm, you have to wonder, don't do you want to live? Do you want to be somebody? Why are you running around with that wrong crowd? Why are you running around with those gang bangers? Why are you running around with them sissies and lesbians and homosexuals? Don't you want to be straight? I want to know what do you want because it seemed to me that something uh, that's not congruent, that there's that, 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 a behavior that doesn't line up with what you say you want. Oh, Lord, you say you want to be somebody. You say you want to be healed, but you won't come to the altar. You say you want to go to heaven, but you won't even come to church. You say you want to get right, but you won't do right. You say you want to be a man of reputation, but every time we look around, there you go over in the corner somewhere. My question is, do you want to be made whole? Oh, Lord. I wonder, as we talked to the college students, I was sitting there as Elder Amanchuku made his presentation as First Lady Wooden and uh, uh, Elder Wilson made their greetings as Elder James Faison talked to them about the investment that is made in them as the cooks cooked and as the saints worked I thought about the bags and the baskets that have been prepared on Thursday night the saints that have gone out and bought things to give to the kids to show our support but I know this that no matter what you do if that person don't want to do right all those things will come to naught but if you got do right in you, oh, if it's down in your soul, the devil can't stop you. I've made it this far because I want to be saved. I want to serve the Lord. I want to be a Christian. Do I have anybody here who really, really want this thing? You want it like you don't, like you've never wanted anything else. You want it like you more than you want to live. If you really want to be saved, if you really want to be whole, ah, lift your hands and tell God thank you. Tell God thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus said, do you still want to be made whole? Is there still an independent determination in you? What was the question? The question implies that Jesus said, I know that two years into your condition, you still believed that you would walk again. 
I know three years into your condition, you believe that perhaps you could get to the water. And I know seven or eight years ago, you had to feel something because while you were here, oh Lord, in the city of David, in a manger, I was born, oh Lord, but it's been 38 years. I want to know, after all this time, is there something in you that tells you I can still get up from here? Oh, there's something in me that says the Lord will still make a way. I wonder, can I get somebody who's been struggling for a long time to praise God because you believe that even though it hasn't happened yet, he's still able, he's still able. I'm gonna have to, I got, I got to break my own rule today. You got to grab somebody by the hand and pull them and say, it can still happen. It can still happen. It's not too late. It's not too late. Yeah! That man didn't know that Jesus was gonna stop by. And that man didn't know. You know something? He didn't know who he was talking to because Jesus didn't identify himself. He just walked in and began to have a conversation. The reason I know that the man didn't know who Jesus was is because when Jesus asked him, do you want to be made whole? The man's response was a good one. It was a good one, hallelujah. He treated Jesus with respect, but he did not worship him. He didn't say rabbi. He didn't say Lord. He didn't say master. He said, sir, sir, I ain't got nobody. Sir, I've tried down through the years and sir, made it but when I was almost there somebody got in ahead of me somebody wave your hand and say I'm almost I almost made it about 10 people to shout over disappointment. Go on and praise the Lord in the face of your disappointment. In the face of them almost. Almost. Near miss. Just about. Lift your hands. Tell them yeah. It hadn't even happened yet, but you're praising him anyhow. It even hadn't even happened yet, but you know that God is able, and when the time is right, he's gonna do it. You see a note of self-pity in his answer, but it really wasn't pitiful. It wasn't self-pity as much as it was a description of the way things were. And you got to understand, in his mind, the paradigm was, the cure was, the solution was, that you got to go, you got to get in the pool, and you got to get in first. You see, God forbid, but if I was in this building, and the building was on fire, 
and I was under the impression that the only door that I could exit through was that side door. Uh, and there may be hundreds of people trying to get out that door. And there I am in the back trying to get through. Everybody's desperate trying to get through that door. What do you think would happen if somebody would tap me on the shoulder and say, there he is, there's another way, there's another way out. That man, all he knew was I'm waiting for an angel to trouble the water. But I had Jesus say, I am that living water. somebody Jesus didn't need a pool Jesus didn't need the pool Jesus didn't even talk about the pool Jesus looked at that man and said arise get up but well, done it right get, 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 get up get, 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 get up get up if you're on the Lord's side get up Somebody will praise him in here. You can't hold me down. Get up. Oh, Lord. Get up. The Lord said, Rise. Roll up that car and walk. Get up. And you know what happened? To show that he is independent. Somebody's going to meet me at the altar. Determination was still there. See, when Jesus, when Jesus said, get up. See, you, you, you can't, you can't get up if you don't try to get up. You, 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 you'll never know whether you can get up or not if you don't try to get up. When the Lord said, get up, that man didn't say, I can't. That man didn't say, my legs won't work. That man began to, good God Almighty, I think I can, I believe I will. I'm getting up from here. Somebody, I wonder have anybody here who will say I'm getting up from here. I've been where I am long enough. I've been struggling long enough. The devil been trying to hold me down long enough. I've been slipping and dipping long enough. I'm gonna get up. The, the, the determination. That independent determined. You know what? He didn't ask anybody to help him. Right, right, right. He didn't say, y'all grab my arm. Uh -huh. He didn't say, pull me up, fellas. Right. He got up. He got up. And then turned around and broke the Sabbath in the eyes of some carnal people. He rolled up the car. You ain't supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. Rolled up the car. Grabbed the thing. And start walking. The Lord told me to tell you. Don't you lose your independent determination. No matter how many times you've tried and failed. No matter how many times the devil has tried to break your stride. No matter how many times the enemy has said to you. You won't get this. You won't get that. You won't get your house. You won't get your car. You won't get healed. You won't get delivered. Oh, I'm going to torment you for the rest of your life. You, you'll never get free in your mind. You're going to be depressed. You won't make it. All that stuff. My God, the Lord told me to tell you today. Today, 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 rise! Take up your bed and walk. If you have your independent determination, meet me at the altar. Hallelujah. 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 He's able! He's able! Yes, he is. Oh, yes, 
and it keeps my soul in him I'm set fast while the billows roll I am secure even when the wind blows he's my anchor and he keeps my soul now my anchor holds in the storms of life, while others fail beneath the strife, when the heavy tide comes and my cable strains, my anchor's firm and it shall remain because Jesus is my anchor and he keeps my soul. Oh, lift your hands. See, you got to be determined. You got to be determined. No. So you know what we you know what we've done? We become a Dr. Field church. All we want to do is talk, 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 talk. Let's talk, 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 talk. Look at how short that conversation was. Look at look how short that conversation was. Look how short the conversation was. Ball down. All this other stuff. Ball down to one thing. Do you want to be made whole? Man said. Uh, sir, if you're going to cure me this way, I've been trying. That got through. But Jesus let him know, I don't have to go that way. See, we, we want to, we, we, oh, we need all this therapy. That's the, you know that stuff is not, that, that is not biblical thinking. Biblical thing, we cast the devil out. And then you just stand your ground. Do you know? Once I tell you that God is able and to stand your ground and stand on the word, I ain't got nothing to tell you about that. So I need to talk some more. About what? I've told you. And you know what you do? Say, well, I stood and it didn't work. Keep standing. Keep standing. Well, I said, I said, Satan, the Lord rebuke you, but, but I still kept feeling, feeling bad. Keep saying, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Or go and change it and say, praise the Lord. Uh, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Satan, you are rebuked of the Lord. You keep on. You apply the pressure. And you don't let up. Because this thing is a pressure thing. Well, Pastor, I need to talk to you some more because I need another word from the Lord. I don't have another word. I told you what the Lord told me to tell you. And if the Lord tell me something different, you won't have to call me. I'll call you. Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? Who wants to be made whole? Who still have that determination? Father, Jesus, you said today that somebody would take up their bed and walk. Somebody would get saved today for real. Somebody will put certain, oh, trials and tribulations and bad habits and failures that they would close the doors on it today. Hallelujah. That you would make a way for them if they still have that independent determination to be delivered if they still believe somewhere in their spirit that you're able to do it hallelujah jesus that you break paradigms you shatter operations you don't do it like the others did it you're god and you do it any way you want to in the name of jesus well, Father, right now, Father, right now, we declare deliverance 
in this place we declare healing in this place we declare deliverance in that hospital room he shall be made whole we declare deliverance hallelujah hallelujah to the saints of God brother Rollins to the saints of God we call our names in the name of Jesus God deliver sister Barnes we declare deliverance in the name of Jesus those who are streaming those who are listening those who are here the Lord said take up your bed and walk the Lord asked do you want to be made whole you ought to show him you ought to show him by praising him by worshiping him by going for it I want deliverance. I want to rise. I want to get better. I want to. I want to, Lord. Lord, I want this. I want what you have for me. Lord, I want this. I want to be who you'd have me to be. Lord, I want this. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I want the Holy Ghost. I want to be filled. In the name of Jesus, 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 I'm tired of the spirit of fear. I'm tired of the spirit of dread. I'm tired of the spirit of depression. I'm tired of this affliction. Have your way, Lord. 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 Have your way, have your way. Woo! Woo! Somebody's getting blessed right now. Somebody's getting blessed right now. Somebody's getting blessed. I'm ready to be saved. I'm ready to be saved. I'm ready to let loose. I'm ready to let God have his way. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Ready, ready, ready. Ready, ready. I've been on the perimeters. I've been playing church. I've been playing with this thing. But I ain't playing no more. Save me, Jesus. Deliver me, Lord. Rescue me. Somebody's getting blessed. Somebody's getting through to God. Somebody's getting through to God. It's been a long time, but I still believe. It's been a long time, but I still believe. Glory, 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 glory to God. That's right, Brother Luther, praise him up there. Got his hand lifted. You ought to praise God with him. The devil, they, the, the, oh, they've ridden him off a thousand times. Supposed to have been, been buried by now many times, but he's a fighter. He's a fighter. Woo! Do I have any fighters in here today? That guy said, I have no man. Who needs a man when the God man showed up? He didn't have a human, but he had Jesus. He had the God man. Let him bless you. Let him bless you. Let him bless you. Let him bless you. Let him do it in your soul. Let him do it in your mind. Let him do it. Let him do it. We're almost done, but let him. Let him. Let him. Let him. Let him. You let allow God. 
allow him. Give it to him. Let him. Hmm. I didn't say make him. Let him. Let him. Allow him. If I be a man of God, something shifted. He shake our boss up. Something shifted today. No more trapezoid pool for you. Go home. Go home. Go home. Somebody needs to be saved. Somebody needs to be saved. Somebody got saved five times. Now it's time for you to get saved for real. We'll pray for you right now. Lift your hand. The Lord will save you. Where are you? I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm ready, I'm ready to give up everything, everything to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. He'll save you. He'll break every yoke. And when the Lord make pleas like this, they're never made on this order for nothing. When ignored, the time won't come back. Next thing you know, somebody's dead, and then y'all trying to fix it at the funeral. You can't fix this. Hallelujah. She have not lost her independent determination. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I anoint you to be made whole. God, we prayed about this and prayed. And Father, he is your servant on the altar saying, God, I have not given up on walking. I have not given up on my limbs being made strength strong again. We rebuke this disease. We rebuke this condition. In the name of Jesus. And we say to you in the words of the Lord, rise, take up your bed, and walk in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Somebody ought to begin to praise him. Somebody ought to begin to praise him. Oh, God. I believe you, Lord. I believe you, Lord. I believe you, Lord. I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. Oh, God. Seen you do it so many times. Lord, do it again. Lord, heal. In the name of Jesus, take off that cane. Give her the active use of her limbs. In the name of Jesus. My God, somebody throw your hands up. Somebody throw your hands up and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. However long it takes, I'm not going to stop believing that he can. That he can. 38 years later, that day, Jesus said, long enough. Long enough. You're talking about a brand new life. <sighs> You're talking about a new lease on life. Oh, my. The Lord has given somebody today a new lease. A new lease. A new lease on life. 